Nottingham Trent University. Working with you. Proud sponsors of Working Week. On Working Week this week, uh, the top Nottingham restaurant that is celebrating its 21st birthday. You always have a good time when you come out. So uh, whether you're on your own as a couple or with, with you know, family or friends, yeah, fabulous place. Yeah, it's really nice. I met local staff, and what the, one of the bestest staff ever was Francois. And he was gorgeous, and he's gone to Belgium, and I miss him terribly. <laughs> and if you're a business looking to export abroad, mind you, where else would you export, actually? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right, stupid yeah. thing to say. <laughs> We've got some tips from a company doing exactly that. We've always tried to differentiate ourselves from everybody else. So we don't supply a, a Me Too product. We try to make something different that the customer can use. So whether that's putting their name on the, on the filter or whether that's making something unique for them that they can then market themselves as their own product, that's what we always try and do. And a glimpse into what business will be like in the future with a Nottingham expert. Ooh. Will we have as much? No, we won't. But we might be happier because of it and it will change the business landscape. You know, the amount we repair, the amount we maintain, that will that, be different. Hello, I'm Rob Pittam. And I am Des Coleman. And sometimes, Des, I get to strike lucky. I get some interesting stories. And I've oh. been out to see Le Bistro Pierre, which is the restaurant just around the corner from here, yeah, right. celebrating its 21st birthday. It's a really interesting story, this one. <laughs> It's a Nottingham success story with a distinct French flavour. Le Bistro Pierre is celebrating its 21st anniversary, but it grew out of the collapse of a restaurant chain. Nottingham folk with long memories will remember it as Pierre Victoire, part of a national group of restaurants which went out of business. But the people running this place decided to keep it open. That was in 1994. Since then, owners Rob Beecham and John Whitehead haven't just rescued this restaurant, they've opened up more and more around the country. There are 13 now, and staff are delighted at its success. It's been amazing. I've known John and Rob for a long time, even before I started working here. They've done so well building the brand and building it from when Pierre Bitsoir collapsed and then building it to up as the Bistro Pierre. And now we still like to maintain the independent feel, but you know, we've got 13 restaurants now. It's amazing how quickly they've grown, and obviously I've been there more or less since day one. Company operations director Marilise from Brittany has been here since the beginning. So Marilise, I'm going to take a stab in the dark here that you might be French. Yes, that's right, yes, uh -huh. yes, all the way from Nantes, yes. And how did you end up working here then? Uh, well, I came to study business uh, in Nottingham uh, at the Trent University, and I was looking for a part-time job, so they had me as a waitress here. I was working part-time back in October 94. So how has it changed over the years? It might seem a daft question, but I mean, I remember it you know, way back 20 years ago. It's changed a lot, hasn't it? It's Pierre Victoire, massively. I came when John and Rob just opened the restaurant, so it's been, it's been two months in the running, so they were getting their head around the restaurant business themselves, so massively. I mean, we were just a little team of 25 people people per restaurant. I came to manage the restaurant in Derby and again it's a little team of 25 to 30 people so from 55 people to suddenly 450 people in a company. The job has changed concentrating on people business. It's become a massive people business with lots of different more structured uh, environment and, uh, and work so yes it's changed massively. On a Tuesday night at half past five in the evening, the restaurant is already filling up and some of the customers have been coming here for more than 20 years. We've booked our son's graduation today, 20 of us. I've booked my 50th birthday here in October because it's such good atmosphere and good service. And you're supposed to say, I can't believe you think good. I was just about to say that, of course. There are, though, other French restaurants in Nottingham, but at Le Bistro Pierre, they welcome the competition. It's good to be kept on our toes, so definitely we embrace competition. We prefer when it's competition near us. It brings more people in the area, so we're definitely happy to have competition. And yeah, it just forces us to get better and better. Yeah. 
We've just recently opened Bath, which is a bit of a smaller restaurant, but it's very much a bistro look about it, very French. You know, they've got the nice tables and chairs outside. We can't do that here, unfortunately. But you just look for the right sites and then just keep building the brand. It was always going to be a Midlands-based enterprise to start with, but then it's just, it's just, you know, the, you know Torquay was a, you know, the one before. It's like, so it's nationwide, basically. With more restaurants opening up, this Nottingham French Bistro is becoming a hit around the UK. And next up, and you actually might be interested in this. Caught me out there. That was very quick, but carry on. <laughs> if you're actually thinking about exporting, take a look at this. Yeah, because this is a Nottingham company that's exporting around the world. And also, we've got some interesting advice for you if you're thinking of doing the same. New premises and a new look for a company that's been manufacturing in Nottingham for almost 50 years. We're coming up on the train through London. Micromesh was founded by Bob Underwood in 1968 and now his son James runs the business on Dable Avenue in Bullwell, but not before he served a long apprenticeship. Well, I've never liked these press caps anyway. I've been working there since I was about five years old, at weekends and school holidays, and full time since I was 18. And he started me off on the shop floor, so I got used to making these kind of things, making the filters, putting these together, assembling them, getting on the spot welders, getting on the resin machines and putting them all together. Um, and then I moved up and developed into the sales area and then developed over into uh, managing. And uh, now we sell into multiples of industries. We sell into the rail industry, we sell into, still into mining industry. Although there's very little left now in the UK, we sell over in India. The company has customers all over the world. Its filters can be found in passenger trains, Triumph motorbikes, earth moving equipment and Challenger tanks. At a time when manufacturing has been struggling, they've continued to expand and now have 22 people working for them. Well, I got Mary Dunnan five and a half years ago. My mum was a cleaner here. And um, James offered me mum to see if you want to come in for a couple of weeks' work. I was like, yeah, anything will do. And then ever since, it just kept me on. You can see that you get this perfect seam all the way down there. And it's drawing in a younger generation too. James Riley has worked in the filtration industry all his life, but was keen to work for a company which makes the goods it's selling. So this backs up, so this just makes sure that it's formed into the right pleat height and everything goes through smoothly. It's manufacturing in the UK, so I can go out to the shop floor and see, you know, from start to finish how a filter is made. The next move for the firm is an export drive to India where it set up its own company to supply the mining industry out there. Micromesh has made the most of the export help that's available from government and after opening up markets in Poland and France too, it's also aware of the pitfalls. This isn't coming down right? OK, just put the jig in there, let's just have a look. What we found is there is some danger when you go to a new export market, things can start to wane once you come back. So you go and do an exhibition, you go and see the people, you have some good meetings, and then when you come back, you have your own business to attend to, and things tend to, to drop off a little bit. So in the past, we've used um, the Nottingham Chamber, and they have a, a scheme whereby they send you a student called the ISPO, and they'll send you a student from a university, and you can have those for six months, a language student. So we've used French and we've used Polish in the past to develop markets. It's a company flying the flag abroad for Nottingham Engineering and looking to expand and create more jobs in the future. So we heard that Micromesh has had help from UKTI, a government department, in its export drive. So what kind of help do they offer? Well, with me now is Ian Harrison, who's from the UKTI in the East Midlands. And Ian, is this a typical kind of company that you would help? Yes, it is. Um, we work with a whole range of companies, manufacturers, service sector, um, from very small to very large. So when it comes to a first-time exporter, what are the kind of things you're helping them through and telling them to do? Um, well, well, we advise them on a whole range of things because exporting is not uh, uh, the most simplest thing to do, but we can help to demystify the uh, approach for them. So um, as part of our programme, we have language and culture advisors that, for example, will advise somebody to, if they're, if they're exporting to New Zealand, to say you shouldn't sit on the table because that causes offence, or if you're exporting to Thailand, you mustn't give somebody a watch because that means that they're counting down to death. And what have firms from around here got to off the world? What are we selling them? All sorts of things. I mean, I, I worked with a, the, there's a company we work with called Ampli Amplitude that sell hearing induction loops across the world and a very interesting product. 
Um, we work with another company called Chinook that do uh, waste to energy and are selling that to, to the UAE. A very, very big project last year, won the Queen's Award for that project, very innovative technology. Um, there's another company called RootSafe that uh, do safety wires and they've, um, they've provided those safety wires to uh, the uh, King Abdullah Stadium, which is the largest uh, football stadium in Saudi Arabia. So a whole range of products that are kind of uh, emanating Nottingham and, uh, and are exported worldwide. And finally, how can people get in touch with you? Just use gov.uk. If you, you can either Google us, type, so type in UK Trade and Investment or UKTI, uh, or go through the www.gov.uk forward slash UKTI site and you'll see a full suite of our products. So I actually thought it was quite interesting stuff from uh, Ian there. Yeah, really interesting. If you're interested in exports, well, that's it for the first half. Did you, that pigeon nearly hit us. <laughs> it got quite close, didn't it? That's it for this half, though. But in the second half, we've got some insights into what business like will be in the future. We know that resources are going to be tighter and tighter. Um, everything from metals, minerals, energy, in the 2020s, it can become a crunch point. And as you know, uh, Nottingham is always on the map, but did you know it's on the map as a backpacker's destination, a place with a lot of style. You said backpacker so poshly then. Say Did that you? again. Back backpacker. 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 And a Geordie accent, backpacker, doesn't sound doesn't right. Sound quite right. That's yeah. why I did the link. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's true. We found this good hostel. It's, um, I think, a good start to um, explore Nottingham. People are so friendly. You know, actually, the staff uh, are my friends now. And the thoughts of our business expert. I'm going to change position for this. Go on then. It gives it more weight. Richard Baker. Richard Baker. All sorts of things are happening or going away in the background which are going to change the way we live, change the way we shop and probably change the way we work. Nottingham Trent University. Proud sponsors of Working Week. Nottingham Trent University. Proud sponsors of Working Week. Welcome back to the second half. We'll be looking at how Nottingham is a new destination on the backpacking trail. They yeah, I said it, backpacking. Yeah, backpacking. You wanted to get it in, didn't you? Since I got off the train, you know, I loved what I saw. Um, I think it has a good balance between not being a very big city, but also it's not a, a very small town. It's very compact. It's got a lot of, lot of culture, uh, a lot of gigs are going on here. It's a cheap place to be as well in comparison to London. And I think the fact that it's so compact, it's so easy to kind of see all the pockets and hidden gems of Nottingham. And from mining on the moon to 3D printers. It's great, oh, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than travelling to a store, a customer may go online, select a design, colour, material and size, and then print out their shoes on a personal 3D printer in their own home. I guess a futurist is someone who helps people understand future possibilities. So you can't predict a single definitive future. If you could, I'd have the crystal ball, I'd be doing next week's lottery numbers every week. But you can help people understand the range of possible futures based upon technologies we know about, based upon where the Earth's resources will be. If mining on the moon is too far into the future, we've got a closer look at what will happen to the Nottingham economy with our favourite Richard Baker. Boots has taken on board Apple Pay, use your phone to pay for things. Uh, we've seen 3D printing, an awful lot of research going on to that at University of Nottingham, and it could mean that manufacturing comes back. All that to come, but first, Des, go on. Actually, I'm going to pick your brains here and go get on. inside the mind of Des. Oh, What's your vision of the future? How does it look? What are we all doing? Oh, well, I'll tell you what we're all doing. We're not wearing any clothes. <laughs> I, knew, no, I knew something like that would happen. No, seriously, yeah. because yeah. people are so, so, people are so, they look at people and say, yeah, let's go au naturel. I'd go au naturel, would you? Well, that's one vision of the future. <laughs> but here's a Nottingham guy who's an expert on what we'll all be up to and how we'll be working and earning a living in au the naturel. years ahead. Except for the au naturel bit. It's a glimpse of the future, talking about the technology that will be available and what we can do with it. And it's all put together by a beast and man who's an expert in guessing what the next big thing will be for us all. 
and we've come to a suitably futuristic setting. This is the uh, Jubilee campus at Nottingham University, which I'm sure most of you know anyway. And joining me is Chris Barnett, who works at the business school here at Nottingham University. And, and Chris, I suppose, you know, I was expecting to have a crystal ball there. You know, yeah, you're yeah. a futurist. What is a futurist then? Well, I guess a futurist is someone who helps people understand future possibilities. And then people can make choices based on that. So how does a futurist actually work with business then? One is to go and actually just talk to people and try and raise awareness, trying to get people aware that their current planning horizons, most businesses work you know, on, on a one-year plan, maybe a six-month plan, they might claim, claim a five-year plan, but there's not a lot of focus on it. And one of the biggest wins I think I get in companies is to say, let's have a ten-year plan, let's have a five-year plan, let's be thinking more broadly about the decisions you make. Welcome to another video from explainingthefuture.com. This time, I'm going to talk about the future of payment systems. Of course, the trick is knowing what all this technological development will mean. Chris might not have a crystal ball, but he has all the tricks of the internet age to explain it. And yet, in the future, we might not have to present anything at all, with payment depending entirely on the verification of our identity. I think there's going to be a big change in terms of localization. Many more things we've produced close to where people are, within maybe 100 miles of where people live, which was the case throughout the majority of human history. We've just had this fascination with globalization for the last few years, and, and, and that's changing. We've had a revolution in the past sort of 20 years of the microprocessor. The internet has changed things, smartphones have changed things. We're about to get a revolution in how we make things with what you could call microfabricators, devices that will allow us to produce things locally. They might be what we now call 3D printers. They might be means of producing things using life itself, what's called synthetic biology. It might be nanotechnology. But the opportunities to turn digital things into physical things on a local basis are really building up. And I think that will revolutionise business in the next 20 years. In his work, Chris addresses the big question. What does all this mean for how we live and work in the future? Creative consumers may even customise their shoe design using an app created by the manufacturer, or may even come up with a new shoe style all by themselves. And if you want more insights into the future, check out Chris's website at explainingthefuture.com. Of course, many people may not want or be able to afford a personal 3D printer. A long way into the future there with Chris Barnett, but actually it's looking quite nice in the present. It's isn't gorgeous it? right Sun now, actually, yeah. It's raining there earlier there. as well. But if that was too far ahead for you, let's find out what the immediate future has in store for us in Nottingham with our business expert, Richard, Richard Baker. Baker. Well, Richard, we've just had that vision of the, um, the long term future, if you like, you know, mining on the moon, 3D printers and all that kind of thing. What's your take on it? Well, 3D printing is one of those technologies that's going to come to the fore in future and all sorts of things are happening or going away in the background which are going to change the way we live, change the way we shop and probably change the way we work. You know, that we've seen Boots has taken on board Apple Pay, use your phone to pay for things. Uh, we've seen 3D printing, an awful lot of research going on to that at University of Nottingham and it could mean that manufacturing comes back to countries where things are sold rather than taking place thousands of miles away and having goods shipped back over. And we're seeing apps and artificial intelligence again on mobile phones. Who knows whether or not your doctor might be something you carry in your hand in future. All of that's got massive implications for jobs, for the skills that we need and for the way that we work. So who knows where this is all leading. So is this a scary vision of the future that we're looking at? Well, here's a tale that says that maybe things might evolve in a slightly more manageable way. You get back to the 1960s and in Nottingham there was a business that sold a lot of furniture, did it on the old HP, higher purchase and ledger clerks used to fill in all these forms from people applying to take a loan to buy a bit of furniture. Started to drown in paperwork, what would it do? Well, it started storing all that data on those newfangled computers in the 1960s. Uh, years later, it got data about what people bought, how much they paid, where they bought it. What did it turn into? I can't guess. What is it? It's Experian. So that's a sign that good things can come out of things that are changing now. Things may change quickly, but they may change in a way which is a lot more manageable. So there are big changes on the way, but we can probably cope with it. And looking at some of those things, you know, there might be good news. If manufacturing, for example, comes back to more local areas, it's the kind of thing we're, we're good at, isn't it? So we could see a resurgence in manufacturing, maybe? Could be good news, but it won't be the kind of manufacturing that we used to have. You know, you look back at Nottingham's past and we used to have loads of people working in the rag trade, working at rally, thousands of jobs, nine to five, all that kind of thing. This is likely to be different. The vision we have is of small machines doing intelligent manufacturing, and who knows, this mobile phone I'm waving around could be manufactured in your own home. 
a home from home for backpackers from across the world. Tucked away in Eldon Chambers off Wheeler Gate in Nottingham is Igloo, a hostel like no other. These are our sleep box inspired beach huts. Right, great. And are they popular? They are, yeah. I think people are really liking them because they're so unusual and they're very compact, they're cheap as well, and yeah. it's a way of getting a single room in a bigger space. Yeah, it was a nice day, yeah. What'd you do? It's been set up by Bettina Christiansen, who has worked in hostels for over 20 years. So how did you get all this kitted out? It's high quality furniture, isn't it? It is, but it is mainly all second hand or has been given to us by people who no longer needed it. Originally from Denmark, she's travelled extensively herself and learned first hand what tourists are looking for. Well, it came about about 20 years ago in 94 when there was a severe lack of backpacker hostels, or well, there wasn't one in Nottingham. It was set up by uh, an old colleague of mine. I came here in 96 when I was 18 and started managing it. Um, they are very much meant to be home away from home, um, very social, very friendly, very warm, welcoming. And as we kind of grew from the dormitory accommodation we had, we expanded into private rooms to kind of cater for a different audience who would probably choose a hotel in the past, and that was really popular. And four years after that, we kind of expanded again and did more family rooms, business quarters, and so forth. And this is our sort of latest addition to the project. It's really a TARDIS, this place, isn't it? It keeps going. It does. And how many rooms in total? 19 of all different sizes, so all dorm rooms, private rooms, single rooms, sleep boxes, and the ensuite rooms as well. Recently opened, the building has been lovingly converted from an empty office block and has been welcoming travellers from all corners of the globe. Do you have any rooms tonight? Uh, yeah, we can go I've come from Mexico, uh, from Mexico City. I come from Germany, northeast Germany, it's near the Baltic coast. I'm working here in the University of Nottingham. We are here because we are um, watching the Indie Trust. Nitrex Festival. Especially from 2010 when recession really set in, people were forced to find cheaper accommodation options or work in different cities as well. So that was really beneficial for us and it also ensured that we could kind of show off what we were doing and people were getting used to hostels, not being as grim and grotty. I wasn't really happy about getting into a hostel, but it was the only thing that I could find at the moment. But when I came here, it was a great surprise, you know, like the place is brand new, it's really clean. So I'm really happy about it. It's been a good experience. So this is our hammock room, which is one of our ensuite rooms, and it has a memory foam mattress, reading light, uh, USB ports to charge your phone, so wherever you're from you don't need adapters anymore. Full length mirror, uh, there's a TV, free view TV for the room as well. And this particular room is the ensuite, so it's got its own shower and toilet facility. Back in the day it was generally people who were travelling, backpacking around, but in the last sort of five, eight years it has really opened up to people coming here for gigs or people coming here to study over the summer. Lots of people come here just to learn English as well during the summer period and we get loads of business folk as well coming through who are working in town from Monday to Fridays. With cheap rooms and friendly staff, Bettina strives not just to create a successful business but a community as well. Yeah, nice people, that's why I'm here. People are so friendly, you know, actually the staff uh, are my friends now. It's got personality. It's got a nice social hub where people can socialise, meet each other. They can cook their own meals so they can save money on that. It's got a lot warmer service as well. We have time to socialise with our guests and so forth. And it's not just your four white walls within a corporate shell. Bettina has more plans to expand the site and further encourage tourists to come to the city to see what Nottingham has to offer. Well, that's it, Des. It's been a great programme. What have we had? Uh, we've had Mooning in a Mine. You mean Mining on the Moon? Mining yeah, your moon, favourite, yeah, Joe. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. yeah, we've had the Backpack in Hostel. Richard Baker. We've had Visions into the Future. And also advice on how to export if you're a business looking to sell abroad. Yeah. What more could you ask for? I think uh, we could say tatty bye and walk off into the sunset. Plenty more next time. We've gone that way or that way? Uh, you go that way, I go that way. See you later. See you later. Cheers. Nottingham Trent University, working with you. Proud sponsors of Working Week.